أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب قلوب العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد In the introduction we mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had described Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi in the Holy Quran to carry the greatest of characteristics and merits that any of his creations carried. But when we come to the books of history and hadith and narratives of some of the Muslims, we find the opposite. So, is this the sunnah and the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi or is it the tradition and the sunnah of those who aimed at the roots and the foundation of this great religion and aimed at the roots of Islam. For example, we take the story of Abu Darda when he uh, met with Muawiyah and he mentioned to Muawiyah after he saw him eating and drinking in golden and silver cups and plates and silverware that this was not of the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and that Muawiyah that you are accumulating wealth from interest and this was not of the tradition of the Prophet peace be upon him and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The response from Muawiyah was that I don't see any harm in these two actions, me eating and drinking in golden and silverware and me taking interest from people to accumulate wealth. So is this the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi or the tradition and sunnah of those who aimed at the roots of Islam, this great religion. And the traditions of Al-Buhayqi it is mentioned that one year the Muslims at the time of the ruling of Uthman, the Muslims were in Mina at the time of Hajj. And at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, Rasulullah would pray two units of prayers which is called Qasr. But Uthman, at the time of his ruling, he prayed four units in congregation with the Muslims. Al-Buhayqi mentions that Uthman became ill one day. So the Muslims requested from Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afwala salati was salam, to lead them in congregational prayer. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati was salam asked them, would you want me to lead you in a prayer of congregation that is similar to the congregational prayer that my beloved cousin and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi would lead in the city of Mina, which were two units, two rak'az, or you would like it to be otherwise? They all raised their voice that no, we want the prayers of the Khalifa or the ruler of their time, meaning Uthman ibn Affan. And Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi afwal salatu was salam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, immediately declined their request and told them that you must pardon me, I cannot take. Uh, I cannot participate in such an act with you. And he left them. It is mentioned in Sahih Muslim 
by Ibn Abbas that at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when a person would uh, commit a divorce, even if he said to his wife, Anti Talib, three consecutive times repeatedly, that that divorce would only fall once. So meaning even if he mentioned it three times in a row, it would not be three different divorces for his wife to become haram on him until someone else marries her. But Muslim says, narrating from Ibn Abbas, that at the time of the ruling of Umar, that he changed this law. His justification was that if a person is saying the divorce three times, he must be in a hurry. So if he's in a hurry, we should count them as three times. And since that day, brothers and sisters, in most schools of thought, besides the Ja'fari school of thought, if one were to divorce his wife and to repeat the term anti taliq three times, it would only be one divorce. But in other schools of thought, since the day that Umar justified this act and innovation, if other Muslims were to mention this three times repeatedly, their wives become haram upon them permanently until someone else marries them. When it comes to the call of prayers, Adhan, when a Muslim man raises his voice and the call for prayers for his brethren to gather for congregational prayers or for them to know that the time of salat and prayers has come, an innovation occurred by the name of tathweeb or categorized under the name of tathweeb, which is by calling upon the Muslims as-salatu khayrun min an nawm that prayers are greater than one's sleep or is greater than one sleeping and this occurred at the time of the ruling of Umar ibn al-Khattab several narr narratives from Islamic heritage and hadiths exist containing this story or several different stories that are very similar to one another. That one day he entered the masjid and he saw or witnessed the mu'adhan, the person who calls the Muslims to the times of prayer, that he was sleeping. So he commanded him to wake up and to raise his voice in tathweeb to mention in his adhan as-salatu khayrun min an-nawm and in the hadith that Sa'd ibn al-Qard the mu'adhan of Umar was the first mu'adhan to raise his voice in tathweeb during the call of prayers and that Bilal the mu'adhan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi did not accept for him to raise his voice in the call of prayers in the way that Umar commanded him to do so. So here we witness another innovation that did not take place in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, meaning that was not of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, nor of his tradition. Now, our dear viewers, how did this confusion occur? What started all this confusion? Or what erupted all these innovations amongst the Muslims? 
I can recall several stories, historical events. For example, Al Jahil says that one day Al Hajjaj gives a sermon in the Masjid of Kufa and he starts to remember those who visit the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi or make pilgrimage to the city of Medina. He states in his sermon that God curses those who visit the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the city of Medina. Those who visit sticks and stones he does not mention that these people are going to visit their prophets, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says that they're visiting sticks and stones. On the other hand, in his sermon, he says, Why don't these people visit the palace? The palace of their Khalifa. Now, let's see the comparison. He curses those who visit our beloved Prophet. And he says they are visiting sticks and stones. But if they visit Abdul Malik bin Marwan, their Khalifa, then they have sought nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end of his sermon, he says and states, Don't they know that the Khalifa of a man is greater than the messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them? One's Khalifa, like Abdul, uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, is greater than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the heritage of some Muslims. By the words of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. In another tradition by Al-Khalid Al-Qasri, this narrative states that he mentions and swears by his Lord. He swears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one's Khalifa is greater than all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sent upon mankind for guidance to guide mankind, to have them walk upon the straight path. Messengers like Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Noah, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi That one's Khalifa is greater than all the messengers that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent upon the sons of Adam for guidance. In the book of Tahdeeb Tariq Dimashq states that Al Hajjaj would mention to all those around him, to the Muslims who saw him as a person in the position of power, as a person in the position of legitimacy, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never stopped revelation, never stopped revelation upon the rulers of Bani Umayyah. Now brothers and sisters, we must ask ourselves, if these hadiths exist in the books of the Muslims, are these the traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi or the tradition of people like Khalid al-Qasri, people like Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, so whom do we take our religion from? Some of these hadiths, some of these narratives are in the most authentic books of the Muslims. Books, as we mentioned, that come directly after the Qur'an, as genuine as the Qur'an seen in the eyes of some Muslims. And when it comes to Islamic tradition, and hadith of some Muslims, not only the position of prophecy or prophethood 
or the position of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had significance or respect. But even when it comes to the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that millions and millions of Muslims make pilgrimage towards, have no significance. They have no respect for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we read the history and the heritage of some Muslims. When it comes to the Kaaba, when it comes to Maqam Ibrahim alayhi salam, when it comes to the water of Zamzam, we see to these rulers of Bani Umayyah or Bani Abbas, these unjustful rulers that placed themselves on the necks of the Muslims to rule over them just for power. Neither the Kaaba or Ma Zamzam, the water of Zamzam, or Maqam Ibrahim had any significance, nor they showed any respect to these places that millions and millions of Muslims see them to be holy. In the book of Al Aghani, again, Khalid al Qasri says that if my Amir, Abdul Malik bin Marwan commanded me to destroy the Kaaba brick by brick. I would do so. And if my Amir, his Amir, Abdul Malik bin Marwan commanded me to take the Kaaba brick by brick to the city of Sham, Damascus today, I would obey his command and I would destroy the Kaaba and take it all the way to Damascus. Brothers and sisters, we see the situation of the Muslims. Those who ruled over the Muslims, this was their respect towards what we see as holy. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were willing to destroy the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just because their emirs ordered them to do so. So, we must realize that at the time of the rulers or the Khulafa, it's not what we think or what we are told as it happened. Thus, we need to clarify history and the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what occurred in his lifetime, what occurred after his lifetime. Brothers and sisters, Muslims came to a point that a person like Hudayf ibn al-Yamam, a commander of the Muslims, one of the leading commanders that were in charge of bringing Bilad Faris, the land of Persia, into Islam, says that I feared my prayers in public, I would not make my salah in public. That Muslims were in a situation and a time era that every single one of them feared to make their prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in public. And we had to conduct our prayers in secrecy or privacy. This is Hudayf ibn al-Yamam, one of the greatest companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi saying this. So how about when it came to the average Muslim who was not a general of the Muslim military or the Muslim army? When it came to the average Muslim, how do you think they lived? What kind of persecutions they lived under? Now our dear viewers, after hearing and witnessing such events and historical occasions within the Muslim history, Islamic history. We see that we cannot rely on all sources that are represented to us. We must filter Islamic heritage, Islamic history, what took place, what is true, what is false? Of course, 
What I present is not from myself. We'll present the sources of every single hadith and occasion or story mentioned on this show. Our dear viewers, join us on this program in which we will try to illustrate the most authentic of events and most authentic history that took part in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi before Islam, before his message, during his life, and after his departure. This is all for today's episode. Join us in the next episode of the Master of Messengers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.